let's get to the amazing interview. We talk about the cultural decline of American empire, how America is a nation of hustlers, and Professor Berman's critique of Noam Chomsky and Sheldon Woolen, and do we get the leaders we deserve? The answer may just surprise you, or will it? Hello, everyone. I'm here with Professor Morris Berman. He is an American historian and social critic. Professor Berman has served on the faculties of multiple universities in the U.S., Canada, and Europe. He has written extensively about the decline of America way before Donald Trump came along in a trilogy of books, The Twilight of American Culture, Dark Ages America, and Why America Failed. I will be asking um, him questions from his newest book, Are We There Yet? Essays and Reflections, 2010 to 2017. He now lives in Mexico. He also has a website you can check him out at morrisberman.blogspot.com. And he also wrote a political fiction book about America, The Man Without Qualities, published in 2016. Welcome, Professor Berman. Thanks for the invitation, Alex. I appreciate it. Now, I wanted to have you on because uh, you critique American culture a lot, and uh, your analysis of culture, like I said in the beginning, goes way beyond Donald Trump. You even wrote uh, your first book, The Twilight of American Culture, uh, before 9-11 happened. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. It was uh, published in 2000, but I was working on it from about 1996 on, you know. So, yeah, it anticipated, uh, I mean, it it predated uh, 9-11 for sure. Mm -hmm. I just say that, yes, because I think when history is written, uh, a lot of it will be written about the one-off of the, the one -off events, the signature events, um, two of them I just mentioned. But I, I think your, your critique goes much deeper than that. Uh, we're going to be talking um, bad-mouthing America a lot in this podcast, and I think that um, America deserves a lot of bashing. But before we start, uh, you grew up in America. You now live in Mexico, like I said. Is there anything about America that you like? And you can answer that any way you want. Oh, Yeah. I mean, uh, first of all, you know, I have friends there. I enjoy going back from time to time. I have no interest in returning to the United States or living there. But um, it's always, you know, fun to go back and see my friends and walk around Manhattan and um, sort of like, a, you know, a magic picture show in some ways. But when I look back at American history, uh I mean, when I think of the things that are positive about the United States, uh, I think of things like jazz. True, it had African roots, but, um, uh, you know, jazz is an American invention. Uh, Hollywood is an American invention. I love watching uh, uh, Laurel and Hardy and Buster Keaton and all that early stuff. You know? <laughs> Excuse me. That's kind of nice. I also am very grateful to America for its uh, open immigration policy down to the early 20s. Um, down to the early 20s, the stuff written on the base of the uh, Statue of Liberty, give us your tired, your poor, and so it was true. You know, our arms were open to people like my family on both sides who were tired and poor. And uh, in addition, uh, were fleeing religious persecution. And uh, frankly, when they arrived in the United States and they weren't going to get murdered in pogroms, uh, they were uh, quite relieved, you know, and uh, loved the United States, and I can understand that. Um, it was a very different country, of course, at that time. But then in the early 20s, there began to be a kind of nativist sentiment about uh, limiting immigrants, especially Jews, you know. And so by 1924, the gates had shut. I mean, there was a quota system, and it was then became very hard to uh, get in. But the open door policy down to 19, the early 20s was, I, I wouldn't be alive without it. I mean, I wouldn't be here talking to you. And um, of course, uh, the United States gave to the world the idea of democracy. I stress the word idea. It didn't really give democracy because we've never really been a democracy. It was always a cover for making money. Um, but uh, the idea of democracy is a great idea. Uh, wish we had lived up to it, you know. Uh, but we didn't. Nevertheless, the, uh, the idea is a great one, and I think it has inspired a lot of revolutionary movements historically. So all of these, those things are uh, very good aspects of the United States, uh, now largely eclipsed, you know. Uh, you can still listen to jazz and Hollywood's awful now. <laughs> you know, 
I much prefer indie films. Uh, but um, nevertheless, the, the, all, all that's real in our history. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I have your book here, and uh, you wrote in this paragraph, here's what the U.S. lacks, which I believe Mexico has, community, friendship, appreciation of beauty, craftsmanship, as opposed to obsessive technology. Is that why you, you moved to, to Mexico? You found all these things you wish the U.S. had? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, Mexican history is uh, extremely interesting. It's very, very different from the United States. Uh, the United States really is the only country I can think of that was born bourgeois. In other words, it never had uh, an ancient feudal tradition. Uh, not at all. It was, it was born with the idea of hustling, and that's what it has been uh, ever since. That's what the pursuit of happiness. Those are code words in the 18th century for go out and make money. And um, the, the, uh, so the history is very different. And Mexican history, of course, uh, you know, starts, I use that word in quotes, uh, starts with uh, the invasion of Cortes and uh, the Spanish overrunning the Aztec Empire. But there were there are two strains then in Mexican history. One is uh, the aggressive and arrogant and also hustling uh, tradition of Spain. Let's get the gold. And the other is the native community, uh, which has all those things you just mentioned: community, friendship, craftsmanship, meaning, purpose, real purpose in life, and so on. And those things have been in conflict in Mexico down to the present. And although, uh, thanks to a number of factors, and in the 20th century, especially the Americanization of Mexico, uh, that Spanish tradition has sort of overrun things. At the same time, I was aware that Mexico has still a traditional culture. And I was right. I mean, I took a gamble. I moved here in 2006. I started planning my escape from the United States in 2004, but it was a gamble that I would be able to find pockets of traditional culture. It's also the case that you find ways of relating to each other that are very different from those in the United States, because basically in a culture based on hustling, everybody is just instrumental to your own purposes. You know, that there are means to an end. You're not really interested in other people. Most Americans don't know the names of their neighbors. And, um, that would be incredible here. It would be extremely unlikely. Uh, and so although there, there are pockets uh, in the, you know, the rural countryside of Mexico, it also extends to Mexico City. I rent an apartment, for example, in Mexico City. I remember a few months ago coming up the stairs. I'm one flight up. There's no elevator. I'm coming up the stairs uh, with bags of groceries and plastic Bags and one of them breaks, and every everything you know, box of Kleenex, oranges, everything spills out on the stairs. At the top of the stairs, uh, a door opens, and a girl of about five years old peers out, and she sees what's happened without saying a word to me. She comes down the stairs and helps me pick up all the oranges and every the vegetables and everything else put them back in the plastic bags. And when that's done, she walks back up the stairs and closes the door. The possibility of that happening in the United States, first of all, girls, women, any female in the United States is taught that men are dangerous. And you you don't talk to them. You know, I mean, you get your throat cut or raped or something like this, you know. And secondly, People's problems in the United States are their problems. You're not your brother's keeper, and you're not responsible for anybody. Uh, studies of the degrees of empathy in the United States show that it's abysmally low. Americans don't care about other people. They, they just don't care about them. It's me, myself, and I all the way. How did this five-year-old girl learn uh, that this is, in Mexico, is what we do when somebody's in trouble? Her parents taught her that. And their parents taught them that, and so on. And that's what I mean by a traditional culture. People are connected and responsible for one another. She didn't know me from Adam, but she didn't, you know, close the door and say, oh, it's a dangerous man, or this is not my concern, I don't care. She came down, you know, her parents weren't there. She just came down the stairs by herself, helped me put everything back in the plastic bags, 
and then went back home. Um, that stands out to me as almost emblematic of the difference between Mexico and the United States, or traditional cultures, and you know, one like Cortez's Spain, that's just some, you know, 16th century version of kick their ass and take their gas. Um, that's that's the difference, and I didn't want to be in such an alienated and callous culture that the United States is. I didn't want to be living among such people anymore. And I have to tell you that when Americans ask me, do I have any regrets about moving to Mexico? I say only one, that I didn't do it 20 years earlier. No, I, I don't have it bookmarked here, but I, I did love the story. It, 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 uh, it pierced my heart, or my mind and heart. You tell a story about how you were going to get a license plate. And I believe also in that story, maybe it's in a different chapter, correct me if I'm wrong, you talk to the husband, the, the, the wife of the family, or the, head, the, the wife of the family helps you get that license plate. Um, she throws everything to the side and helps you um, in this belaboring process to get the license plate. But also... Yeah, that, that's an essay. That's an essay. I think it's called Love and Survival. And it's an essay in the book you mentioned, Are We There Yet? And basically, that was, that was right. I was driving around for many years uh, here with a beat-up old Chevy with uh, American plates. Uh, from Washington, D.C., and finally, if I wanted to get permanent residence, which I did, and I felt it was time to do, I needed to get Mexican plates, so I had to drive back up to the border, about 12 hours away from where I am, and uh, it turned out that I stayed with the niece of a close friend of mine here. Uh, they didn't know me from Adam. I mean, the only thing they had to go on was, that Brenda had to go on, was her aunt's uh, testimony that I was a good guy. Well, you know, I mean, they just put, they just knocked themselves out for me. The entire family did. And, uh, it was, uh, it was quite amazing that, um, uh, you know, they helped me get Mexican plates, which, you know, involves bribing people and stuff like that. (laughs) And, um, uh, and so finally I, I succeeded with their help, but I mean, they just uh, welcomed me with uh, open arms and one of the stories I tell in that uh, little vignette in the in the essay collection was that uh, they had a you know a kid about seven or eight years old. Uh, his name was Ricky, and um, he I was sitting on a couch and I was writing about my experience there at the time. He walks by, goes to the refrigerator, to, out of the freezer, he takes out a popsicle uh, in uh, Spanish, police. And he takes out a popsicle, and as he walks back, he says to me, do you want one? He's he's seven or year, eight years old. I'm in my 70s. I'm a gringo. He's never met me, me before. But again, it's like that five-year-old girl I mentioned. Life is not just about you, which is what it is in the United States. Life is about other people, too. And for this kid, to where did he get it from? Of course, his parents. They say, you take care of other people. So as he walks by, I mean, an American child wouldn't even look. Here, here's this kid saying, do you want one too? I mean, I didn't want a popsicle, but I said, you know, no, Ricky, thanks very much. It's very kind. Another story that, that hit me was, I believe it's the same story, but you were talking to somebody else in that family, and you suddenly started talking about a conversation you said you would never have in America. I believe it was the Israeli-Palestine conflict, and why does the oh yeah, US well that was with Brenda's husband. That's okay. right. Uh, that struck me because you talk about how I agree we never have uh, very erudite discussions in America, and um, then th- you talked about I believe how this man, you know, he didn't have a PhD, he didn't have all this education, but even he wanted to have an intellectual debate on uh, foreign policy, which is not seen much in America. Yeah, I mean, this guy was a foreman in a factory. You know, his name is Memo. He he was Guillermo. He he was uh he is a foreman in a factory and uh not college educated or anything like that. But the degree of sophistication is different. Um, you know, typically when an American student wants to do uh a year of college abroad and he goes to Germany or France or whatever, and let's say he's a I don't know, a college senior or something like that, they have to put him back two or three grades. You know, because American Americans are so stupid and so 
informed about nothing that they come to Europe and the the equivalent really to a, a college senior in the United States in Europe would be uh, a high school senior. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's all that sort of thing. So um, what was your, sorry, I've lost track. What was your question originally again? I just pointed that out. No, we started out with, that was just all on the first question. Was there anything about America you liked? But I, I was finding it interesting that even that man simply asked you a question that you would never oh, see right, right. Yeah. by Anderson Cooper. We were talking Cooper. about memo. And, and, yeah, I mean, here's a guy who wants to talk with me about the uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict. As I say, he's just a foreman in a factory. Um, can you imagine the equivalent in the United States? Uh, I remember Jay Leno did interviews with people you know, he would do this thing called jaywalking when he had his program. And I remember once he would ask people, what's the religion of Israel? And they would come up with things like Israelite. I mean, they were so stupid. And this is the norm in the United States. We know nothing. There's nothing in our heads. And this is the, the type of thing that um, you know, you go to Europe or Mexico, you find that people are informed. They're actually informed. They don't have to have formal education to be informed. Uh, they're interested in the world. Americans are interested in themselves and video games. No, no, I, I completely agree. And in in the past, in, you just talked about it. You mentioned it briefly. Uh, you describe America as a nation of hustlers. What do you mean by that? And has that always been true? And I said since 1776. But I think in the book you talk about, I guess, the beginning of capitalism. Yeah, I, you know, Alex, I was inspired. I mean, I have to give credit where credit is due. And I do. It's in uh, Why America Failed. Um, to Walter McDougall, who is an historian at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Is that right? Yeah, I think so and um, won the Pulitzer Prize years ago for one of his books, and is just a brilliant historian. And he wrote a book many years ago called The Freedom Just Around the Corner, which was a history of the United States. And one thing he says in the beginning of the book is that we are a nation of hustlers, and that the, the most dominant characteristic of the American psyche is what's in it for me. And when he says, you know, when two Americans meet at a party or something like that, what both of them have on their mind is, how is, can this person be beneficial to my career? In other words, you're not interested in the person themselves. You're interested in what they can do for you, especially with regard to money. And, I mean, I, that's my entire experience of living in the United States. You know, I was a... Uh, college professor, university professor for many years. And I remember, you know, going to history conferences and somebody who vaguely knew me, let's say, would come up to me and we'd be talking, but all the time he's looking over my shoulder to see if there's somebody more important that he can talk to who will promote his career, because I certainly couldn't. Um, it's, there was no interest in the other person. It was, what can they do for me? And that's the, that's the kind of atmosphere and tone that defines interactions among Americans, that they're all hustling all the time. And this, uh, histo excuse me, historically, it really starts in the late 16th century. I mean, there's a book by Lewis Hartz, uh, let's see, The Liberal Tradition in America, 1955, in which he introduces the phrase fragment societies. And by fragment societies, he means that colonies that break off from the mother country and they just take a fragment of the value system or the way of life of that mother country, not all of it. And that becomes their value system, that fragment. Well, the people that were coming over in the late uh, 16th century uh, were the British entrepreneurial class. And the literature that was used to entice people to come to the colonies reads like contemporary real estate brochures. You know, come over, you'll make a killing. And this is the class, that's the fragment. The fragment is hustling. These are the people that came over and these are the people that set the tone and the reality uh, for the nation. 
So it's sort of like um, this is what this is what you get, and the culmination of it uh, is that you get a person like Trump in the White House. Trump is no anomaly. He is no. I mean, all this business that he's somehow some sort of strange aberration. We got to get rid of him because he's like uh, a cancer in the body politic or something. Baloney, baloney. He is America. He is what Americans are striving for. It's no accident he wound up in the White House after 400 years of hustling. Who do you think we're going to elect? Mm-hmm. No, uh, a great. I didn't bookmark it again, but you mentioned Obama and how empty Obama was. I think you talk about a particular moment, but you mention the emptiness of Obama when we uh, sometime in the book, and that he again also reflects the American psyche of how empty we are inside. Yeah, I mean, the the thing is that um, hustling is not a spiritual path. Hustling is empty. It's what, what is the goal of hustling? It's simply more, more of anything. You know, it's not that you have something in mind uh, that is nourishing to the soul or, I don't know, makes you a responsible person. And, and not, not at all. It's just to acquire more and more and more. And that was from the late 16th century, runs through the founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson. All those people were wealthy. They died wealthy. Thomas Jefferson died with 150 slaves, which he didn't free upon his death. He just, you know, turned them over to his, willed them to his progeny. Um, all those people were very wealthy. That's what, that was, that's what life was essentially about. And um, so, that, I mean, that's the, the situation uh, that we're in, really. Gotcha. And uh, what was I going to say? Yes, I, I'm reading Howard Zinn right now, and I think he mentioned that George Washington was the richest man at the time of his presidency. Oh, yeah. No no question about it. I mean, it was... I can't remember the figure in terms of, you know, $1,800, but it was nearly $2 million, which what would be, you know, $2 billion today or something like that, you know. And um, as I said earlier... Pursuit of happiness was code language in the 18th century for um, acquiring property and, and acquiring wealth. So, yeah, a, a nation of hustlers that uh, started out that way lasted, you know, right through the Declaration of Independence and the separation from England. And now today we have Trump. That's been the major theme, the major, uh, you know, chord, harmonic line of the United States. Gotcha. Yeah, no, um, Trump is not a problem. He is uh, what we've always been. He's our true face. As, as yeah, he's the United icon States. of yes, he's the what icon. the United States is, you know, and um, this this notion uh, that some writers have, like Noam Chomsky, let's say, that there's this elite that's oppressing the rest of the country. Well, that's partly true, but it's also the case that they have 99% is quite happy to be oppressed. They have bought into that system, and they always have. And their goal is not to overthrow that 1%, it's to join it. And so, you know, Trump is, in a sense, the national hero. And uh, he can be demonized, for example, along nativist lines. I mean, I don't care much for the guy, obviously. He's anti-Semitic and uh, sexist and racist and a whole bunch of ugly things. But the one thing he does represent is that goal of the late 16th century and of the founding fathers, that life is about wealth. He is, he embodies the cult of the self. Yeah, a more narcissistic figure, it would be hard to find, except for the man in the street. (laughs) You know, just go out and find anybody, any American in the street. And what their preoccupation is, is with themselves. They're not going to help some guy whose groceries fell, you know, fell out of their uh, plastic bags. They're not going to come down the stairs and and have help them gather up the stuff. They, that's not going to happen. They're not going to say to to uh, somebody sitting on a couch as they walk by, "Can I get you a popsicle?" Also, they're not going to. They don't give a damn about the other person. No, I completely agree. I could go on on this, but you in the book you call. You just talked about, but you call Americans temporarily, every American a temporary embarrassed America, um, um, sorry, millionaire, essentially the 99%, a temporarily embarrassed millionaire. 
Well, that's a, that's a line John Steinbeck, you know, the great novelist, um, who said that, uh, uh, you know, socialism could never come to America because uh, uh, the poor in the United States regard themselves as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. You know, they're all sitting around waiting to, for their ship to come in. It's never going to come in. It's a myth. Uh, all the studies we have are that you don't get out of the class you were born into. That's very, very rare. And um, so the the ideal of the man in the street is the same ideal as Donald Trump. The, to say that, uh, uh, that it's all manufactured consent, uh, not quite true. I mean, that's the false consciousness argument that, you know, people are running around with ideas in their heads that belong to somebody else. You know, when Janis Joplin saying, oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? She's talking about 99% of the country. No, yeah, yes, we will also get back to that Noam Chomsky point about do we get the leaders we deserve? And obviously you've made your point clear. But on to the next question. <clears throat> um, you talked about how technology influences culture and how that has become a cancer in our society. And I think you mentioned in the book how it's a cancer in both ways, how we've lost our connection with each other more so, and how I think the radiation of the devices also may cause cancer or change our brains. Yeah, that's, I mean, the, the Alex, the, the data on that is iffy. Uh, that is to say whether it actually does create brain tumors. There's some evidence, but um, it's, it's not established. It's just a possibility at this point. Uh, and it may turn out to be true, but a lot more research is necessary before we're sure about that. However, no more research is necessary to establish that it's a social cancer. The uh, pile of articles that are by now have accumulated on the effects of smartphones and cell phones, especially on the youth, their literature is enormous. And it shows depression, anxiety, alienation, um, not knowing anything, not having anything in your head, um, a, a, a kind of sad and empty world. And it is also, there are studies showing that it may change the brain physiologically. I'm not talking about tumors now, but there are studies showing that uh, it looks like it lengthens the synapses in the brain. So people that are using this, and that's virtually every American except me, I don't own a cell phone. What do I need it for? Um, but uh, the, the Americans that use it, that is all of the country, uh, are getting dumber and dumber and dumber and more alienated and less empathic to other people. And uh, it's a very, very destructive device. Parents who use it a lot around their children, studies have shown that the kids are depressed and anxious as a result. Um, the, the literature is enormous. And, you know, on, on a global scale, Robin Wright, the actress, has led a campaign against the purchase of smartphones and cell phones because... In order to manufacture those things, you need rare minerals, and these are in mines in the Congo, and because of the working conditions, uh, which are horrible and very exploitive, and the vapors given out by these metals, it turns out that the death rate among young males in the Congo, uh, that is, you know, from 20 to 30 years of age or whatever, is very high. They, they die at a young age. And that's because we have to have these toys. Um, and that, to me, is disgusting. It's just disgusting. I, I, I agree. Now on to the second part of my question. Uh, I, I just I wanted to ask more about, I guess, the, the mental side of technology. And there definitely are a lot of surveys showing how Internet use increases depression. But I was going to ask, uh, when you were growing up, was technology still isolating people as much as the cell phone or the smartphone is, in your opinion, and I mentioned the uh, the automobile to a lesser degree, or do you think this is like a quantum leap or a, a new age of technology where it is this isolationist, or have we always been fragmenting society through technology? Well, you know, when I was a kid, the tendencies were growing. Um, you know, I remember uh, living on a street that was uh, paved with red bricks. And the neighbor coming by with a petition 
I was like 11 years old, coming by with a petition to pave the street with asphalt. And um, he wanted to know if, you know, my mother was home or whatever, or if there was an adult that could sign this petition. And I remember, I, I was only 11 years old, I said to him, I don't want you to pave the street. And then, you know, of course it was paved. I mean, they, you know. And then there was a uh, subway system in a town that I was born in. There was a sub- It was ripped out to put in the interstate highway. And what, it, what had been a kind of quaint uh, and, and lovely uh, part of the city now is just, you know, a concrete highway. And so I watched these things happen, you know, as a kid and, uh, you know, a teenager and young adult. I just watched that growing. But the larger picture, you know, beyond my own uh, circumstance, the larger picture is that uh, the automobile has been the most destructive thing in terms of the planet and climate change uh, than any other invention we've had. It also isolates people so that they now sit in steel boxes on the L.A. freeway, hating traffic in their lives, not talking to anybody. Um, Technology with the exception of medical technology, could probably have stopped development uh, around 1910 or 1915. We did not need the car. We could have had mass transit. Uh, we did not need, uh, which is a you know a separate type of technology. Um, we did not need the airplane, uh, usually mostly used to fight wars. Uh, people before then were getting across the ocean in a week or a little less maybe on ocean liners. It worked very well. There was no hurry. But, you know, we we are constantly thinking that a faster life and a life that it helps you accumulate more and more goods is a better life. It isn't. It isn't. Um, we were, uh, in so many ways, in, in a much better situation prior to that, and certainly prior to uh, the cell phone and the smartphone, which is, I believe, a quantum leap. Um, you know, you walk into a cafe today where people used to be reading newspapers or talking with each other, getting to know the person at the next table, making uh, human connections and so on. Now they're just staring into laptops. You know, I mean, they, they're they not interested in anybody around them. And I'm sad to say this has infected Mexico as well. A couple of my favorite cafes, I mean, I'm excluding Starbucks because that's a horror show. But you know, pretty decent cafes. You walk in and everybody's sitting there on a laptop or a cell phone. And I think, you know, well, I don't care if the United States goes down the drain because that's happening anyway. But I don't want Mexico to go down the drain. However, I'm a guest here. I can't say too much. I I, I understand. No, that was a good answer. You talk about in the book, uh, you talk about another book of which someone wrote about how we're obsessed, and I believe it's called Apparati, and that we oh we are obsessed oh, wait, with wait. Oh, it was by Gary Steingart. Yes. Uh it's super sad true love story. There you go. You said yes. You you encourage everyone to read it. Yeah. It's uh it's a sort of uh, dystopian novel but only projected about 30 years ahead in which the ethernet breaks down. And so all these devices are useless because they're not, you know, they're not working anymore. The trouble is people have forgotten how to read. They've also forgotten how to interact with it, with one another. So it's a, it's a very, um, I think, a prescient kind of novel because I think that day is coming, maybe not 30 years from now, but I think that that day is coming. And we have lost uh, the, the most basic qualities of being human uh, to a kind of virtual reality. I, I've been at concerts where I've watched people, instead of actually looking at the violinist who's performing a solo, they have their smartphone up and they're looking at the picture of the violinist doing his solo. Uh, it's I would re- regard that as demented behavior. No, I, I I I agree. You know, reading your book, I must say, I live in Texas, and you made me think about moving to Mexico. Uh, but um, next question wouldn't be the worst thing you could do, kid. I know. <laughs> so. Uh, next question. I, I think about this all the time now that you've given me the term to think about it because I think it's so true. Um, 
Please explain how Americans have historically used a negative identity, is the term you use, to think of themselves in the context of the world. Um, can you explain negative identity and give a few historical examples? I, I think it's littered with examples, but go ahead. Yeah, the phrase negative identity is from Hegel, the German philosopher. So we're talking about 1810, 1815, something like that. And what he meant by negative identity was not bad identity. By negative identity, he meant that you get your identity by through opposition to somebody or something else. So that if you can be fighting something, it hardens your ego boundaries, and that provides you with your identity. Um, and in the United States, that has largely been our history. Uh, uh, in terms of the soul, the United States is largely empty because, as I said, Hustling can't possibly fill the soul. It's not really about anything. And what we have done to hide that fact from ourselves is always being at war with something or somebody. If you think of the pilgrims coming over, the uh, what they their negative identity framework was that they were not like decadent Europe or England. Uh, they were rejecting all that. So they, the Atlantic was the River Jordan, America was the New Jerusalem, and they were going to cross the river and enter the New Jerusalem and set up this uh, city upon a hill, uh, which uh, was in opposition to uh, the European heritage. So it starts off with negative identity, and then very quickly, of course, the Native Americans are identified as savages. We have to be exterminated. So they are the opposition to civilization and the potential greatness of America. So we do a job on them, and then we move from war to war. Uh, you know, we picked a, a phony war with Mexico in 1846-48, ripped off half, more than half the country. Um, and again, the, the Mexicans, you know, they were not into go-go capitalism. They were backward. They just sat under trees with... Uh, sombreros and drinking tequila. That's all they could do, of course. And so they were just savages and they had to be stamped out and their country robbed. And we moved on, to, you know, the, we have the Cold War, which again, the Russians are demons and, and the, it's, it's called, uh, in theological terms, Manichaeanism. Uh, Manichaeanism is the notion that the world is divided into good and evil and Good is always in here. We Americans are the innocents. We're the good people. And anything out there is evil. So when George W. Bush was astounded by 9-11, never mind what we had done in the Middle East to Islamic countries, screwing them over for decade after decade, never mind that, uh, that maybe 9-11 was a rational response to people saying enough, you know. Oh, no, couldn't be that. Um, it's that we're inherently good. He was surprised. He said, we're so good. Those are his literal words. We're so good. And they're, you know, uh, supposedly the Iraqis. What a joke. It was Saudis. Uh, the Iraqis were ultimate evil. And so we then we had the war on terrorism, which hasn't ended. And now we're in a condition which the American writer Gore Vidal once called permanent war for permanent peace. How long have we been in Afghanistan now? 18 years without a victory. Taliban making a resurgence. Uh, we are in a permanent war, and that suits our personality. Because good is in here, evil is out there. That's how we get our identity. And that's what the, the phrase negative identity means. That um, as long as you have an enemy, really, you don't have to think too much. And Americans don't think very much. Great explanation, Professor Berman. Uh, something else that I remember from the book, I don't have it bookmarked, was I believe you said, remember how boring the Clinton years were because we didn't have a, a, a big enemy such as we just had lost the USSR and we hadn't started the war on terror yet? Yeah, um, of course, the when the wall came down, the Berlin Wall, um, Bush Sr. was the president. And it was very interesting to listen to him because he had no idea of what was happening. He talked about the, a new world order, but they were just buzzwords. He didn't know what it meant. 
because all of a sudden, after all, we had been doing the Cold War since 1945 or 46, um, and uh, we always had this framework, this oppositional framework that defined who we were. See, the problem with negative identity is it doesn't answer the question of what you affirm. It just says what you deny, what you're opposed to. And that's because we don't really affirm anything except money. And so it's a, it, we're empty inside. And we never really get around to the question of what we affirm because we, we're embarrassed by it. We, we can't handle it. So then you have Clinton coming into office. And since we don't have uh, the great monster, the Soviet Union, as an enemy that we can rely on to define ourselves, we just floated through doing nothing at all. Clinton's uh, campaign slogan was, it's the economy, stupid, which is going back to the hustling tradition. That's what we're all about. We're going to make money, you know. And um, that's what that administration was about. But since it wasn't enough, we had to fill it with things like Monica Lewinsky and uh, O.J. Simpson. I mean, one one ridiculous uh, uh, drama after another to fill empty space because once you give up negative identity and the whole oppositional framework, uh, you're faced with the greatest terror of all, and that's the emptiness at the center. And that's something that, you know, is the foundation of Buddhist tradition and all Eastern traditions that try to get people to really figure out who they are. Americans don't want to figure out who they are. Bush Sr. once said about psychoanalysis, which he badly needed, don't stretch me out on the couch. You know, I'm not going to listen to anything about my interior. All of them are like that. All of them are like that. You know, Bush Jr. was an alcoholic. Uh, Reagan was uh, a kind of joke. Um, and and so this is this is the situation, I think, that we're in. Yes, no, I, I think about that term so often because what you just said, we ne everything we do almost is to avoid looking inward, to avoid critiquing our own actions and looking at the monster we've become, essentially. Well, if you're on an airplane and you start to talk to the passenger near, you know, next to you or you're in, a, I don't know, a bar and start to talk to some somebody there about the fundamental emptiness of America or something like that, what you're going, the result, what's going to come back at you is rage. You know, there's not going to be, uh, gee, maybe we ought to think about it. Not at all. What's going to come back at you is rage and you're a traitor. And that's how Americans deal with reality, which is to say they don't deal with it. No. <laughs> no, no, uh, you're completely right. On to the next question. Um, uh, you write, you have a chapter on Sheldon Woolen's Democracy Incorporated, and before you mentioned Noam Chomsky, who's known for his book Manufacturing Consent, that they fail to examine the people themselves. Um, they are mostly known for critiquing the system in their uh, their two books. Um, they talk about how essentially the elites manipulate the masses, uh, and you make the argument, I believe, that you think the American people, and you called them, um, you have a chapter called Playing Taps in the book, um, and the elites Chomsky critique share the same vision and are not at odds with each other. In fact, they are one of the same. Yeah, I mean, I said that before. The ideology is the same. P years ago, the Pew Charitable Trust did a survey, and the overwhelming majority of people who were polled uh, said they had no interest in overthrowing the 1% or making some sort of revolution. Not at all. They wanted to be the 1%. That was their goal, to join the 1%, uh, to have, you know, billions of dollars and lord it over other people. Um, that's why we have Trump in the White House. He's the perfect representative of that whole uh, way of thinking. And, you know, I have to say as far as, uh, I mean, I admire Sheldon Schul Wolin, and I have to say as far as uh, Democracy Incorporated goes, this is something I list in um, that essay you mentioned. It's called Playing Taps, and it's in the book. Are we there yet? If you go through the book very carefully, which I did, uh, it turns out that every few pages, uh, Wolin has uh, a discussion of how the American people bought into what the elites were doing. 
And so when you put the, them all together, which I did, you know, in a long list, what you see that um, he's no fool. I mean, you know, people, uh, there, are, there are many writers, uh, you know, uh, critiques of uh, the American system that, you know, say, well, we have to overthrow the, the 1% and the, the, the corporate masters and so on. He, he's, he's not a foolish person. And he realizes that if you keep saying over and over again in that book, I agree with you that the main theme is uh, that the elite suppress the masses. But then he's got this sub-theme, and the sub-theme runs counter to that. And it's plentiful, as I said, lots and lots of examples. And then he finally says, well, you know, the fact is that the American people agree with all this. Well, once you say that, how are we going to have a revolution? How are you going to overthrow anything if you have a situation in which the great mass of people agree with the system, buy into it, support it? I mean, it's not in this particular essay because I found this information out later. 67% of the American public supports the use of torture. Same, the same percentage approves of drone strikes that, you know, kill thousands of civilians in, in the Middle East. Uh, these are, this is not a population that is at odds uh, with the dominant themes of American history. They just aren't. They are in agreement with it. They are in agreement with empire, uh, with with destroying Iraq. How in the world did we have the right just to go into another country and do a regime change? Suppose Iraq wanted to do a regime change on us. Uh, would have been much better than the reverse, I think. Um, you know, I mean, the, the the hubris and the arrogance, well, the American people agree with that. And that's what comes out at the end of... Uh, Democracy, uh, what is it, Democracy Incorporated, uh, Wolin's book. And um, the the thing is that uh, since he is no fool, uh, he doesn't conclude the book with this kind of shallow optimism that's characteristic of so much of critiques of the United States that at the 11th hour we're going to pull a rabbit out of the hat and reverse everything. He understands that um, that's not going to happen. And so, so you know, I have to say that uh, I admire his honesty and his courage, his willingness to challenge his own dominant thesis, and then at the end say, well, you know, it's not likely there's going to be a reversal of the situation. I mean, there isn't. We're just on a downhill slide, and it's going to continue. No, I agree. And another thing you mentioned in Are We There Yet? I forgot which essay it was, is how to piggyback on what you just said, is the Occupy movement. And you mentioned that the Occupy movement wasn't a, truly about a revolution, in the sense, but about the 99% also having the, the ability or being Bill Gates, being the elites. That's all the 91%. The 99% wanted to be the elites. And that's what the revolution yeah, was. Yeah, I mean, I mean, their hearts, I suppose, were in the right place, Occupy Wall Street movement, uh, of wanting to redistribute wealth. I'd like to redistribute wealth. I think that would be a very good idea. But the uh, problem is that they were never talking about a different value system or a different type of country. It would be the same country, but just with a more socialist bias. And, you know, during those years of, or year of uh, Occupy Wall Street's uh, uh, emergence, uh, I looked in vain online for articles that stated what their position was beyond uh, this division between 1% and 99%. I never found it. Um, going back a few years, 1962, the SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, published, it was written mostly by, I believe, by Tom Hayden, and it was called the Port Huron Statement. And it was an analysis of the ills that beset the United States and what had to be done. And the difference in the sophistication between that and anything that OWS came up with is enormous because those folks back in 1962, the SDS and Tom Hayden, really understood that what was at stake was a whole way of life. OWS never challenged their way of life. What they wanted to do was just, you know, a fair distribution of wealth. But it's still the same rotten system when you get down to it. I I agree. 
Okay, on to the next question. This is the one I guess I am the most uh, looking forward to, as I am not a history buff. But um, you have studied the collapse of the Roman Empire and noted many similarities. What is still unchecked on the death of America to-do list? Do we need another economic collapse? What what else needs to happen? Well, uh, there you know, there's in terms of studying the collapse of empires or large social economic systems like feudalism, let's say. Um, in terms of studying any of these, uh, what you uh, find is that uh, there are certain factors that uh, lead to the decline of those systems. And there is there are two parallel streams, I suppose. One is daily life, in which one day just seems like any other day, but the overall pattern is one of decline. And we're definitely in that. The other is uh, what I call nodes, an O-D-E-S. And nodes include, for example, uh, the Visigoths sacking Rome in 410 AD. Um, the equivalent for us today would be 9-11 or the economic crash of 2008. So we have continuous decline, gradual continuous decline, uh, which some historians for Rome has des have described as the death by a thousand cuts. And the other one, which is where you have death by major cut, like 2008 or 9-11, where a major thing comes along and rocks the system very heavily. So both are going on. 2008 is certainly not the last economic crash we're going to have. I mean, you know, you can be sure of that. And there have been obviously, uh, other attacks from the outside, uh, Boston Marathon, you know, and then all these massacres that occur uh, from, uh, you know, people from Islamic countries that have happened, but nothing uh, on the scale of 9-11. That may have been just a one-shot deal. It's hard, it's hard to know at this point. But the, the thing is that these things go on simultaneously. So what we need to do in order to collapse is just keep doing what we're doing. Um, the, I mentioned four factors in the twilight of American culture. Uh, one, for example, is an increasing gap between rich and poor. Well, we're certainly accelerating that every day. Another is not being able to pay our bills and running out of money. No question about that. Uh, another is the dumbing down of America. No question about that. And then the last one, was what I called spiritual death, where people just give up inside. They don't really care anymore about their own lives or what's happening. And we're seeing that every day. So if we just keep doing what we're doing, and the fifth thing I would add is the term is used imperial overstretch, where basically uh, Rome had to be everywhere militarily until it basically drained its treasury and bled to death. And we're doing that as well. We have something like 800 military bases around the world. And Trump wants to pour more money, you know, maybe another trillion dollars or whatever into the military. I can't remember what the figure was in his budget. But uh, we're doing that. So all we have to do to go down the drain is simply continue on the path we are on. When I wrote The Twilight of American Culture, it was like a red flag. I was saying, here are the factors that brought Rome down. The same factors apply to the United States today. If you're interested in saving the United States, the idea is to reverse these factors, to stop them and go in, and go in the opposite direction. I didn't expect anybody would take my advice, of course. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, what I've seen since I published that book in 2000 is the acceleration of all the factors I was talking about. So where do you, I mean, how is it that we're going to save America or make America great again? How could that possibly happen if you're doing exactly the things, exacerbating exactly the factors that bring civilizations down? We're just, you know, on a downhill slide. Mm -hmm. No, I, I completely agree. I was listening to an interview. You did an interview, someone interviewed you and Chris Hedges on the same podcast. And he just made the point that I think the one difference this time is when we go down, we have 
the ca capacity to destroy the entire Earth with nuclear weapons, and we have the environmental situation. So that may make it more interesting than past um, civilizations collapsing. Yeah, I would put the word interesting in quotes, <laughs> because I think it's a little more extreme than that. But uh, I'm not sure. I mean, he, he may be right. I'm, I'm not sure uh, whether it's going to be... I mean, maybe there could be a contained nuclear war with North Korea, for example. Uh, it seems to me it's possible. Um, and uh, but the environmental question is a, is a whole other thing because it's it's running at the same time that all these other factors are are running. And one of the things I've talked about is uh, whether the environment would be destroyed faster than capitalism will be destroyed. The yes, story it does of seem the twenty first like century is the disintegration of the capitalist system, which has existed now for about uh, six hundred years, and um, uh, well, about five hundred years, let's say. And so this is the century of its decline, and we're seeing that happen. But a lot of what capitalism does, of course, is rape the environment, and the question is whether uh, we will. You know, I don't know if you ever saw that old Woody Allen film, Sleeper. It's quite funny. Um, but uh, the landscape, the social landscape and the physical landscape of the United States 200 years from now, which is when the movie takes place, um, in, in, the, in the film, when the, the drama takes place, is that all that's left is computer terminals and McDonald's restaurants. It's, that's all the American landscape consists of. The rest is like the lunar surface. Well, that, that could come about. I mean, Woody Allen's a smart guy, and it's a pretty prescient kind of film. And that could come about. And that would be because the environmental degradation happened more rapidly than uh, the disintegration of capitalism. So Hedges could be right on that point. I mean, uh, as you say, it's interesting. <laughs> um, horrific, I think, is a better adjective. But uh, we'll see. I mean, we'll, I think we're going to know a whole lot more about constraints and possibilities, even in just 20 years. No, I, I agree. Things are speeding up uh, to whatever conclusion capitalism is going to reach, which, as I agree with you, the environment is disintegrating faster than the ideology of capitalism, which um, they're going to butt heads at some point. I don't know if it will happen like I think it will. Uh, it, it may be worse. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's faster. That's, that's the... Uh, I'm speculating. I mean, that's the question that's hanging in the air as to whether um, we can... I mean, the last essay in this book, Are We There Yet?, is called Dual Process. And what I talk about there is that every time a large system like the Roman Empire or feudalism or capitalism disintegrates, breaks up, every time that happens, concomitant with that is the emergence of alternative possibilities alternative ways of life, alternative structures. And so the feudal system arose uh, on the uh, ruins of the Roman Empire. And in the case of uh, capitalism, uh, the, feudal, the capitalist system arose as the feudal system was disintegrating in Western Europe. So the question is, as capitalism disintegrates, what's going to emerge? And I don't believe it's going to be a socialist system because that hasn't worked out very well. Um, but there is a, a, another possibility of type of green alternatives, you know, alternative energy, alternative currency. And there are all kinds of experiments happening with regard to this, especially in Europe and Japan. And uh, so it is possible that these alternative structures will emerge and basically take over the functions of what the previous system was doing because the previous system is not able to do it anymore. And we can only hope that that happens fast enough because if it doesn't, we're basically in a Woody Allen sleeper scenario. No, no, I hope it, it, um, it goes, it happens quicker than thought. Um, you, you answered my last question is, um, could you talk a little bit more about dual process and how, uh, we transitioned from, I believe, feudalism to capitalism. You mentioned, I believe, a story about our merchants way before capitalism became official. Yeah, that, that's just one example. Um, so let's say capitalism really takes off by about 1500. Um, and uh, 
what we have around 1250 is an Italian merchant who came up with double entry bookkeeping way ahead of his time, you know. Uh, capitalism really can't function without double entry bookkeeping because how do you calculate profit and loss without it? And so it's a keystone uh, of the capitalist system. This guy came up with it in around 1250. And so the question then is, that was part of the dual process. As feudalism was disintegrating, new capitalist ideas were coming in to replace the old system, double-entry bookkeeping being one of them. What would be the modern equivalent of double-entry bookkeeping? You know, is it alternative energy, alternative currency, uh, re retreating from the system, different ways of life? Uh, in the Twilight book, I talk about uh, what I call the monastic option, where you had Irish monasteries, you know, pulling away from uh, the Roman system and developing their own culture and preserving Western culture uh, for a later Renaissance. So there are all types of possibilities here, but those are examples of things that can emerge. Um, with regard to uh, very specific studies of um, uh, dual process and alternatives, I would recommend the um, the works of uh, Joel Magnuson. Um, one book he wrote, for example, is called The Coming Great Transformation, in which he traveled around the United States interviewing alternative businesses and uh, currency systems and energy systems and so on to find out what these folks were doing how real the alternative was and how durable it was. So this is a very interesting book because he was trying to, you know, answer your question. He was trying to figure out what are the specific examples and can they in fact last so as to produce an alternative system. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. My last question, I just want to make this point from your book. You, I believe you talk about in your book, and I haven't, I haven't read your trilogy, and I think I'll get to it one day, about how there have been certain people who have told America to go a different way, to um, veer a different path. And you mentioned Jimmy Carter. Could you talk about what his message was and how we didn't listen to him? Well, there is this alternative tradition. And my in the book Why America Failed, I answer that question. I say America failed because it basically marginalized those alternative voices. It wouldn't listen to them. Emerson and Thoreau and Captain John Smith and the Puritan Divines and Jane Jacobs and John Kenneth Galbraith. I mean, whole list of you know people that were suggesting alternatives to the hustling life and were ignored or regarded as kind of quaint, you know, Lewis Mumford. Uh, those people. Well, Jimmy was the last public voice uh, in his Annapolis speech of July 7, 1979, in which he basically uh, said, first of all, he attacked the issue uh, of negative identity. He said, we, keep, we cannot build ourselves up by continuing to blame all of our problems on the Soviet Union. Uh, he, I believe he quoted the Bible and said that line, uh, I don't know where it's from, maybe the Gospels, of uh, before you uh, look at the log in your own eye, before you cr critique the moat in the eye of your enemy, you know, the speck of dust. And he was really asking us to, you know, this endless game of blaming the Soviet Union for everything. What about us? What are we, you know, I mean, that was not well received. And as far as domestic policy goes, and frankly, domestic and foreign are very closely interlocked in the United States, which is a whole other subject. But he said, we have to get beyond the consumer society. Owning objects cannot make you happy. And we have to uh, get beyond consumerism. Well, the American public didn't want to hear that. And the reaction to that speech, uh, which I, I consider one of the greatest and unlikely talks in American history, certainly given by a president, but the reaction was 
that the very next day, congressmen took the floor of Congress to suggest that uh, Carter was certifiably insane. That he had simply, and they weren't using it as a metaphor, that he had lost his mind. Um, And that is the reaction to anybody who is going to, uh, or, or to call them a traitor, but anybody who's going to say, hey, this is the way the country has operated for 400 years. You know what? We got to stop doing it. Well, I think that Jimmy, bless his heart, was very naive because it was Ronald Reagan who understood that the American people are narcissistic, that they need an enemy, that they are interested in all those consumer products to fill the emptiness in their soul. I mean, he didn't understand this. He just said, this is what we need to do. We need to have a trickle-down theory of economics. We need to oppose the Soviet Union. This is what life is about. And Carter's all wrong. Well, Carter was not all wrong. He wasn't wrong at all. But what Reagan said appealed to the American public because unlike Jimmy, Reagan knew who the American people were. Jimmy had far overestimated the quality of the American person. It's a very low quality. It's low grade. And Reagan uh, understood what the American people wanted. They wanted houses and cars and washing machines and to have an enemy. And he gave it to them. And, you know, that election in 1980 was, I think still is, uh, the most lopsided landslide in the history of America. Uh, Reagan, uh, in terms of electoral votes, what was it, something like 467 to 12? I can't remember. You know, it was ridiculous. And Reagan understood who the American people were, and Jimmy didn't. Jimmy wanted them to be much better than they ever were or will be. And so he got thrown out of office only after one term because Americans uh, did not um, fit into the same, the category that he had in mind of people who are decent and intelligent and want to look at themselves and what they're doing and look at that emptiness in the center. They don't want to look at their emptiness in the center. They just want more money. No, thank you for that explanation, Professor Berman. I will end it there. Just want to remind everyone, you can check him out at morrisberman.blogspot.com, and I'll link his books, The Man Without Qualities, and he has a, a myriad number of books, but we talked about the his essay and reflections book, Are We There Yet?, and uh, his trilogy, The Twilight of American Culture, Dark Ages America, and Why America Failed. Thank you, Professor Berman. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate it.